My name is William Gortney. Mm -hmm. I was born in Harrodsburg, Kentucky in 1924. You want to share your birthday? Three, yeah, March the 1st. How about your family at the time? I had, a, I had four sisters at that time. And my mother and father lived till they were 92, so family has sort of longevity. Mm -hmm. Let's see, right now, I have three children of my own. I'm my widow at this point, and I'm 90 years old and glad to be here. <laughs> You look still young. Thank you. Uh, there is uh, another gentleman sitting beside you, right beside you, and looks like he has many stars in his collar. Would you please introduce him for the audience? This is also William Gortney, Admiral of the United States Navy. I think he's Commander of Naval Forces Atlantic, if I'm not mistaken. You think? So, how you are related? My son. Your only son, right? Only son. Oh. Admiral, would you please introduce yourself? My name is Bill Gordney, and I am the son of Bill Gordney. And we're both uh, naval officers and naval aviators. So there are a lot of uh, parallels between two of you, huh? Well, he's the better leader and the better pilot. So let me ask two Don't of you. Don't believe that. <laughs> let me ask you, what was your rank when you retired? Captain. Captain. And? I'm still active duty as a, as a full at, four star. Four star general, right? Admiral. 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 So I see <laughs> there is some more points there, right? No, what? he's still in charge. In your family? Absolutely. Uh huh. What kind of father was he? Outstanding father. Every child, every child should be blessed to have parents like I have. Mm -hmm. How did he affect your uh, career here? Uh, he, uh, at a very early age, um, put the spirit, uh, desire to be in the Navy and, and uh, be a naval aviator. It took me a while for that spark for me to recognize it. And uh, halfway through college, I decided I thought I might want to go do what my dad did. Mm. So. Why? What especially that actually uh, leads you to, to continue on his kind of legacy here? Uh, it's a great business. It's a family business, whether it's your blood family in this case or your Navy family. And it's, uh, it's, the, it's being part of a, a larger organization than yourself. And I think it's why... Uh, uh, the youth of many nations d decide to serve their nation in uniform. So good to see you both of you together here. Wonderful. I, this is another unique point of this interview. And would you please int just briefly explain what you are doing, the U.S. Uh, US Navy Fleet Forces? Yeah, I'm in charge of, uh, lucky enough to be in command of all of the forces on the East Coast, Naval Forces on the East Coast of the United States. And I'm responsible to, uh, in their uh, manning, training, and equipping, and preparing them to go overseas on deployment, as well as I work for, as the naval component for General Chuck Jacoby at Northern Command, as his naval component, so I'm also responsible for the maritime defense of the homeland. Wow. Wow. So, um, let me get back to... Uh, father here, the Korean War veteran. Uh, what were you doing when the Korean War broke out? It's uh, 1950, June 25th. What I were you doing? I was, I was aboard a carrier on the, we had left Hong Kong on the 20th. June 20th? I believe it was the 20th. And we were in the Philippine area on the 25th and immediately uh, got underway for Korea made our first strikes on the 3rd and 4th of July. The carrier was the Valley Forge. 
And I guess we probably were the only carrier in the Western Pacific at that time. The, uh, the initial strikes were at Pyongyang, the airfield. The first one? The first, first two days, that's a, what we hit. Uh, the air defenses were uh, primarily uh, probably what we would have called about 40 millimeter stuff, maybe a little heavier. There were some yaks. What is yaks for the audience? Was a Russian airplane that the North Koreans were flying, prop driven. We were jets and props in the air group. We uh, probably had um, 20 jets, 20 F-4Us, and 10 ADs, which was attack aircraft, on that particular morning. And on the second day, we about the same, went back the second day for attack. The, uh, my squadron got uh, shot down two of the uh, yaks, and the rest, we destroyed a good many of them on the ground. Uh, it was our first time Navy jets had ever been in combat. So you were very near to Korea, actually, when the Korean War broke out. We were in the west, in west, in the Japan, in the Yellow Sea, is it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I would suspect we probably were operating a hundred miles off the coast at the time. Um, I was a. We have an air group commander who handles all, who's in control of all the squadrons. I was his wingman, and I'm sure that he was the first one across the 38th parallel, and I was right next to him when we went across. So Together. We were probably the first two to go across the 38th. It was really amazing when people said that the war, that Korea had been in, South Korea had been invaded by the North, most of us had no idea how Korea had ended up divided and had no idea about the agreement between Stalin and Truman to divide the country at the 38th. Uh, after the initial strikes, uh, we, would re we went left to refuel and come back and then we operated off the west coast for the entire time that the uh, Troops were retreating down to the Pusan area. Uh, I'm not sure about uh, how many American troops we had in Korea at the time it started, but they were all rather young kids who had never seen combat. Very few of the petty officers or sergeants had even seen combat. It was a really post-World War II stand down that the military had gone through in the U.S. And uh, most of the people that had combat experience had left. So they had a tough time with the our Army and the South Korean Army handling the Russian trained tanks and what have you. Uh, companies that were North Koreans were coming through that area. And we had very little air support except off of that carrier because the Air Force was unable to uh, reach Korea with any of their attack aircraft. They did have some B-29s which could bomb, but it was a while before they got airplanes over there that they could mm do some air support for the South Koreans and the U.S. troops. Could you compare the air forces between the U.N., it's, it's uh, mostly the United States and Australia, some of the Australia, right, and Soviet Union and, 
and, and North Korea at the time right. during the war. How did you compare the... Of course, the yaks were no, uh, no competition against the jets, which could be expected. And until the Russians, or the Chinese, I guess, MiG-21, or MiG, I think they were MiG-17s, start got into the war. Uh, we had very little to, to really... I, I never saw an air-to-air -air combat after I left the uh, Pyongyang attacks. And by that time, we started seeing the MiGs. The Air Force had P-86s, and they pretty well covered the high cover for the rest of us who were doing low attack work. The, uh, until we landed at Incheon, our primary job was strafing anything headed south to try to destroy them. Uh, we had a lot of trains. Uh, I think the uh, air group was credited with something like 54 trains, if I remember correctly, uh, before the North Koreans decided to hide them in tunnels until daylight, until daylight was over, then they'd take them out. But uh, primarily our job was supporting the troops in the south until we did land at Incheon. Then we started operating north of the 38, pretty much. Mm -hmm. I, I heard that Kim Il-sung was really angry, that he thought that he lost this war because of the air power, outnumbering and much superior outpower of the UN forces of the United States. What do you think about that? Well, I would suspect it's a true, a truth is uh, I wouldn't like to fight a war without it controlling the air. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anybody would. When you have mass forces such as the Chinese had when they came across the border, uh, they still, it was the air, air power that was going to keep control them when they did get south. I would, I would say you have to have air power of some sort in a land battle like that. So do you agree that the uh, UN forces outpower them oh, yes. in the air? Can you give me some example how? After the initial strikes, I don't think we ever saw another airplane except until the MiGs came across. What time period are you talking about? Oh, I would say it was probably um, August, maybe September before we saw the MiGs. 1950? Mm-hmm. And since then? After that, the Air Force built up their forces. They brought planes from the U.S. The Navy uh, immediately started refurbishing their carriers and sending them over. By December, when we left to go back to the States, uh, we probably had uh, five carriers over there providing support. And we mostly operated at the, then off the East Coast to get it. Other than ground support, after the initial strikes, that's what our air group did. So you didn't have many dog fighting experience? No, no air to air. Later in the war, a few of the Navy guys did involve in air to air with the MiGs. Uh, on the, in the initial strikes, we, my squadron mates shot down two of the Yaks, but uh, after that, I don't think there was a North Korean airplane shot down that I knew by the, any of our air group. Could you tell us more about what kind of aircraft the jet fighter and the bomber during the war, and what was the one that you actually fly? I was flying an F-9F jet, single engine, single place. It was the first jet squadrons 
that were formed that could go aboard ship. So it was all brand new to us, too. We were new operating. We'd never operated the jets in combat. Uh, really operated them off the ship until the Thalic Forge went over there. Did you have a training pr period for the new aircraft? Yes, they were new. Uh, we had taken deliver of, delivery of them at, uh, in late 49 and um, deployed in our, right after the first of the year in, Jan in 50. And we're really just on a pleasure true cruise until the Korean thing broke out. It was, uh, none of us were very well ready for what happened over there. Both the, the, certainly the Navy, the Air Force, and the Army, all of us were pretty bad shape. Mm -hmm. We'd had post-World War II stand downs. The Navy had about 100 carriers of all types in 1945. When that war started over there, we had a total of five carriers. Nine five is gone. Five carriers operating. So uh, you can see there was a tremendous drawdown, and uh, the other forces were the same. Uh, MacArthur had uh, Eighth Army, I believe it was the Eighth Army. Yes. But it was a very uh, wasn't the best trained army in the world at that point because they were all young, never had seen combat had no idea what they were getting into, and suddenly ran into that. I believe we had about 25,000 troops in Korea at the time. At the time. And they all ended up in the Pasan area with South Koreans, uh, almost getting shoved off, off of the peninsula into the sea. And until uh, MacArthur had the invasion at Incheon. At that point, the North Koreans' supply lines were extremely long. Uh, they were very vulnerable because they couldn't provide anti-aircraft fire for all of them. So they were made interdiction of the railroads and the roads and anything that moved uh, with very little opposition. After they uh, went back and north of the 38th, there was a lot more anti-aircraft fire that in the, we were being subject to. But uh, I think during that, till Inchon, I'm not sure that that I saw any anti-aircraft fire in, in South Inchon? Korea. It just. The North Koreans just didn't have it with them. But they were, certainly had a lot of tanks and a lot of trucks and a lot of railroads. Was a, and that was our primary job, was to try to stop them on the ground, help the Army. Once we moved to the north, we operated primarily off the east coast rather than the west coast. And um, Why is that? Well, primarily because we had more operating room. Uh, I, I suspect, of course, I was only at that time a lieutenant junior grade uh, officer. I had very little input on why they did things, but I would have thought it primarily was uh, logistics and being able to maneuver. Uh, of course, we had, we had landed the Marines, a lot of Marines also on the East Coast after Incheon. Most of the Marines were on the West, on the East Coast. Uh, most of our usable airfields appeared to be slightly to the east of the, on the east side of the peninsula one. Um, but I have, of course, we could operate further north, too. When we were 
when we were worried about the Chinese coming across the Yellow Root, that uh, it made us closer to the places where they wanted us to, to be, mm -hmm. straight and bomb and things. I want to talk about the Incheon landing and how the Marine and Air Power Navy has been coordinated. Uh, when did you first hear about Incheon landing? Uh, it was a pretty well kept secret, except that we knew that something was afoot. Uh, I knew very little about what was going on in Japan and about the loadout, bring the people, and that that was strictly the non-aviator end of the thing. Our job at Incheon was first to provide air cover to be sure there would not be any air opposition to the landings. The biggest problem at Incheon was the tides. As you probably well know, there are huge tides and the fear of getting ships grounded in the oh. Incheon area was the biggest problem that we worried about. From but why, does it, why did it matter to airplane? I it mean, It didn't bother us. Yeah, right. But it bothered all of the people being taken ashore. Absolutely, yes. We, uh, at, let's see, at that time we had one British carrier. Uh, unfortunately, they weren't allowed to fly over land, but they provided air cover for the fleet and helped us. So, they, so we didn't have to provide the air cover for the carrier. So we were available. And um, one of the things, just prior to that, we went in and uh, took out all of the big oil tanks at the airfield in Incheon. Uh, when the Army had left, they left all those tanks full of fuel, which the North Koreans were using. And so we went in and destroyed those tanks ahead of the Incheon Navy. And then the there was little in the way of opposition, like certainly for the air people. Primarily, it was the ground people that had the problem. Do you remember when you received that order to? No. No. I'm sure there, we had at least a week's notice to get ready for it. Weeks. A week, at least. A week for us, because. We could have still been flying while they were moving the troops up there. We, we were probably still flying over to the south and uh, working on the lines of communications from the north. But, uh, Admiral. How often did you uh, fly How did, for the average aviator in the air group? Every day, twice a day? No, I would say we uh, probably would average about every other day for the jet pilots. The prop pilots flew almost every day. Uh, they could do so much more damage. The prop airplanes could carry all kinds of ordnance. They could carry bombs. We couldn't carry bombs or rockets on these new jets. All we had were the four 20 millimeter cannons. and. Uh, so anybody in the Army had a choice. They were going to ask for somebody with bombs and rockets, not with just us. So they, uh, and we did have some night fighters aboard. Uh, and of course, they, they're the ones that trapped most of the trains that came out at night. They destroy the engine, and then in daylight, the rest of us could go and work the trains over. But uh, it was, uh, and I guess the worst thing of the whole thing was when the weather turned cold, because we had no cold weather gear. It was uh, miserable. We had, had we, uh, I don't think we had ever operated carriers in severe cold weather before. Probably not. I don't think so. Uh, so it was a real learning curve to operate in a condition where you had ice in the flight deck and uh, those conditions. We didn't even have uh, 
wetsuits or anything like that and for the first when it first got cold uh, kids working on the flight deck terrible condition because until we got good cold weather gear for them nobody had any idea it was going to be that way but I think the weather was probably the worst thing that we had even for the pilot if, well the pilots if, until we got a a uh, what we called a immersion suit, I guess. What were they called? Dry suit. Yeah. Well, it wasn't a dry suit. It was just a big bag you zipped up around your neck, and just about. But if you went down in that water, you weren't going to last very long. The, uh, you'd be lucky if you could last 30 minutes in the water. It gets so cold. Uh, Admiral. You're listening, kind of, it's like a history and a legend. He, he's the first two that actually crossed the 38th parallel, participated in the Incheon landing. What do you, what does remind you, what do you think about right now here? Well, that's the first time he's ever told me this story. Are you sure? I'm positive. First never, time ever? He never talks about it to me. Now, when I have friends over, he'll talk to them. But if I, if I, he's never, he never told me these stories. What about other stories, general, in general, about the Korean War? Uh, it doesn't talk about it much. That's a military family. <laughs> well, I don't think that's all that unusual, to be honest. Uh, Why is that? I, I'm not sure. I can't, uh, I can't explain it. But I have a lot of friends whose fathers are uh, retired from all the services, and they don't. They, especially from World War II in Korea, they don't, they don't tend to talk much. Father, did, did you have any special reason that you didn't talk all these things to no, your I son? I don't think so, no. no. I just think it was a... I don't think we even thought about it very much. Yeah. At so then, what's the next big kind of uh, battle that you involved? Well, we were... Korea wasn't just a, a battle. It was a continuous fight for the ground forces. Mm -hmm. And we rotated on and off of the uh, line, as we used to call it. We'd go, first we went to, we would have to go all the way down to uh, ok Okinawa to get refueled and rearmed and everything. Then they opened up Sasebo and we started going into Sasebo, which was a lot closer for rearming and maybe. But the carrier has to go in and take on supplies and do things. And so we would be maybe on the line for two weeks and then we would go into Sasebo type thing. But it was sort of a continuous thing, especially in subordinate troops. Uh, when uh, Juan San, Mm -hmm. One sound on mm -hmm. the east coast. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we operated a lot around there until we got the airfields built. And of course, when we taken that, I wasn't there. They just started bringing the Marines. Were having their problem coming off of the Chosin Reservoir when we came home. And uh, the ship that I was on, you can only operate a carrier so long, and then you've got to do some work. And the air group that's aboard the carrier has attrition, airplanes and pilots. Uh, we lost 12% of our pilots. Uh, we had one Marine pilot that we got back at uh, when they had the exchange of prisoners there. POW. The but that's the only one of our pilots that we got back. Uh, so we we left, came back to the States, and uh, as we came into San Diego, uh, they canceled all leave on the ship. The ship was going to turn around in 10 days and go right back, which was really unusual. Since we didn't have sufficient airplanes, they put another air group on the carrier, and our air group went ashore to start recycling and 
to get ready for another trip later. Which was the model that we used in World War II. Mm -hmm. And uh, things hadn't changed much from World War II to then, except for the type of combat. It was just. Have you had you involved in um, involved in chosen few battle, Changjin battle? You mean to withdraw the Marines out of there when the Chinese came in? Yes, when Chinese well, that surrounded. That happened just as we were, after we left. Right? After you, oh, okay. I think that happened the end of November, if I'm not mistaken, or the first of December. So you were actually from the first day of the Korean War, and you left Korea when? In December. We came. We started home in December. Uh huh. Deployment length was how long? Well, it would have started out to have been a six or seven month deployment, but uh, unfortunately, we'd been out there from February till uh, the war started in June, so we had a little added on. So as we, I guess we left in February and got home at the end of, in December. So it made it about, what, a 10 month cruise. Any other major uh, kind of uh Battle that you engaged in Korea? No. Aviators did not fight like in a particular battle, like a breakthrough or something like that. Uh, when they were trapped down at Pusan, it was strictly a matter of supporting the troops that were trapped in there, covering the things at Inchon. But other than that, the, the army just flexed up and down, and, and you just supported them as you could. But there were no really major battles as far as aviators and the carriers. Yeah, knew. Yeah. Um, even though officially it was uh, middle of November, but actually the Chinese troops came, came over to Korea mm -hmm. in early October. As long as I know, it was our, uh, October 5th that the first... We we went up to the Yellow River to bomb the bridges, trying to prevent them from crossing. It didn't do any good because the rivers were freezing. <laughs> you could cross anyhow. But we um, were very restricted. We couldn't cross the river. Uh, you had to bomb down the river or up the river. You don't bomb bridges that way. You should bomb them in the direction they're going. But we couldn't cross that. The, the politics of uh, the Korean War were different. We'd never had that ever happen to us before either, where we were so restricted. Um, Since you mentioned from the very beginning of this interview that you are the first one who crossed the 38 parallel and so on, so that we actually concentrated on uh, actual engagement. But I want to go back to the olive, I mean, when you're growing up. Uh, when did you graduate high school? Where? 42. Huh? 42. What high school? Harrodsburg High. In Kentucky? Kentucky. Right. And after that, what did you do? I stayed in the Navy. The Navy did you government. enlist or were you? I was, I was a reserve. Okay. In World War II. After World War II, the Navy offered some of us a chance to stay in the regular Navy and to catch us up since we were all just right out of high school. They offered us a deal. If you'll stay in and go regular Navy, we'll send you to college for two and a half years, then to a technical school for a year to catch you up with the Naval Academy graduates, which had had four years of education. And that's what I took and I did. And then I stayed till 1970 when I retired. What kind of training did you receive? You were not from the beginning of kind of... Tell them about, Nav you, as a NAVCAT dad, you're a NAVCAT program. Well... So out of high school... They uh, taught us to fly Piper Cubs. What is a little light fabric type airplane to start with? Then they sent us to a, an intensive physical training program 
and then they started through various level of type airplanes till you got your wings. And after I got my wings, then I went to a fighter training base and went through a fighter training base. And after that, you start going to the squadrons and then you train wherever the squadrons are. And uh, the squadron that I was in from Korea, which is this squadron. What is it? Could you tell? The F-51. Uh, we trained out of San Diego, did most of our weapons training in El Centro, which is across the mountains from San Diego. Uh, I can't think of any place else we went to train. Getting ready to go on the carrier, we did that at Brown Field, which is in San Diego. Uh, as a group, we trained as squadrons, and we never really got organized in this particular air group because there was sort of a crisis for us to get to see because they had promised St. Pack fleet who ran the wars in the Pacific that they would have two jet squadrons, the first two jet squadrons deployed the first of 50. Uh, there were some slippages in the program. The airplanes weren't ready. They had to re-engine a bunch of the airplanes, and we just barely made the deployment. So we really weren't that well trained as we normally would have traveled an air group and the squadrons trained. Um, I think our first shock was when we tried to get organized for the first strikes. <laughs> And that's always the case. It says practice in peace because you're going to pay the price if you go to war and you haven't. And that that happened to a lot of us at the start there. But uh, one of the things, one of the reasons I came in so quickly in the military was President Roosevelt had called up some reserves before Pearl Harbor. This little town of Harrodsburg had a National Guard tank company. There was, uh, I'm not exactly sure of the number, there were like 87 kids from this little town that were called up and shipped to the Philippines. Mm -hmm. So they were all trapped on the Philippines. And I think out of 87, we got something like 26 of them survived the Philippine War and came home. Well, there was sort of a, Pearl Harbor triggered a tremendous nationalization program and interest in the military for all the young people that was coming eligible. In my hometown, I think if we hadn't joined immediately, they probably would have driven us out of town because they had all of those kids trapped in the Philippines. So. It wasn't unusual for everybody in World War II that was eligible joined. There wasn't any of this, I don't want to go routine. You didn't have that choice. So, um, Secretary Dean Acheson of the State Department declared that January 12th of 1950 at the National Press Club that Korea is excluded from the American defensive perimeter. Were you aware of that? No. You have to remember, I was a very junior officer. Mm -hmm. I, How old were you at the time? Korean, 50. I was uh, 24 to 50. In 50, you were 26. 26, 26, 26 years old. yeah. Mm -hmm. You are very broad at 26. <laughs> Maybe well, you were broad this way, but not mentally broad. Did you know anything about Korea around that time before you getting into the Korean War? To tell you the truth, I don't think very many people on the carrier even knew where Korea was when it started. So never, never in the operational map, or it had never, we never had been briefed on any. In fact, we had no maps of Korea when we started. Uh, we had some road maps, 
that, that somebody had dug up. But um, and nobody, I, I, I don't think I had ever heard about Truman and, and uh, Stalin dividing the country. Do you know how it happened? How do they actually divide the Korean no, Peninsula? No, it was a very secret conference. Very few people knew that they had made that decision. It was, you know, we'll disarm the Japanese in the south. You can have the Japanese in the north. And the line was just drawn at 38, from what I can understand. It was two army officers one night before Americans and Soviet unions coming into the Korean Peninsula. They were looking for where to divide. And they put the Korean map, and they found 38 parallel just evenly dividing it. And they just got the ruler and then lined it. It's been done in 30 minutes. Dean it's Rusk. It's amazing. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, and it amazes me, too, that they divided all the agriculture to the south. All the industry was to the north. So the South was really at a disadvantage when it came to starting that war. Exactly. Um, look at the difference today. Yeah, look at what's happened now. That's what we are going to talk about soon. Admiral, I saw U.S. Navy fleet forces. Does that have anything to do with the uh, kind of forces that is involved in Asia and Korea? We train, I'm responsible for the doctrine and the standards of all the Navy forces, whether they are trained on the East Coast or the West Coast. So my good friend Harry Harris is the commander of Pacific Fleet, but uh, I'm responsible for the doctrine and the tactics that everybody is trained to and the standards to which they're trained. Mm -hmm. um, that's because our Navy, wherever they deploy, they have to be able to fight and win wherever they go in the world. We don't know where they're going to go. So they could leave here from Norfolk and end up um, uh, in the Pacific, or they can leave from San Diego, or they and they could end up um, uh, in the Mediterranean or in the Central Command Area of Responsibility. So we prepare our forces to be able to open and hold battle space, deal with the crisis uh, anywhere in the world. These days, now the Chinese and Japanese they are closing on, you know, uh, about the Shinkaku Island. Mm -hmm. So there are many disputes and there are many kind of conflicts. So that I think the U.S. Uh, fleet forces around area is really, really critical and is heightened. And recently, President Obama visited South Korea. Mm -hmm. And President Park Geun-hye of Republic of Korea and he agreed to postpone the proposed handover of the wartime command, mm -hmm. which was slated uh, in 2015. Are you aware of that, and yeah. what do you think about that? Well, um, uh, when the uh, uh, Republic of Korea military is ready to command, we will uh, hand over that command. Uh, you know, there's two parties involved. Someone has to command, and, and uh, if that's what uh, uh, the Republic of Korea uh, desires, then we support that. And we follow the lead of what our commander-in-chief says, so we will make sure that we're able to command, we'll continue to command, we'll to con continue to train with our allies and our partners um, uh, against aggression. What is the kind of uh, interest or the, why is it important for, for example, if it is going to be finally signed and agreed, what, what is the importance for U.S. forces to have this wartime command in East Asia? Well, we would prefer uh, the Republic of Korea to do that, to have command of that. Um, you prefer? We would prefer that. Why? Um, well, because we like to train our partners from around the world to be able uh, to take command. You know, it's no different hmm. uh, than anywhere in the world. Uh, and a job that I had in the Fifth Fleet, we trained our uh, uh, the um, many of the Gulf nations. Kuwait, Bahrain, and, and the United Arab Emirates specifically, and they share command, uh, rotate command of, of a task force inside the uh, Arabian Gulf. They share it uh, every three months they pass command. We train with them. That's all part of being a responsible military as commanding organization. So we just feel what's appropriate. Mm. 
That's very interesting. Um, okay, so um, were you stationed in any part of the Korean Peninsula rather than Korea? No, not at all. Hmm. Oh. So tell me about the life inside of the carrier, air, aircraft carrier around 1950. Now you have a very modernized, you know, state of the art. But please tell me about the life there, how, how it all works, and how, how is it landing and take off from the carrier? Well, as you know now, the carriers have what's called an angled deck. You familiar with that? Yes. We had straight decks. Uh, if you didn't catch a wire, they had to have a way of stopping you. They you mean the wire carry, at the, the hook, floor? Yeah, hook. You know, it had, uh, I think we had... Uh, Probably had six back then. Oh, more than that. Eight. Yeah. We had five barriers, I remember. I can't remember how many wires. But if you didn't catch a wire, they were going to stop you with a barrier, which was steel cables going across between two stanchions. What do you mean by that? They stop you with that? That means that... The airplane's going to crash into them. And how about pilot? Uh, hopefully he's hopefully. secure in it. Um, that's probably the biggest change in naval aviation was when we got the angle deck. Uh, we also had uh, different type of catapults. Uh, they were hydraulic, now they're steam, much better. Uh, we, have a, we had an LSO, and all of our signals for coming aboard the ship were from an LSO. Now they use an automatic system or a mirrored system, which helps the pilot a great deal. If I could, the, the difference that the modification, three modifications that really changed uh, aircraft carrier aviation from when my father flew to where I, when I was flying. Um, you were far, flying too? Yes, I, I flew for 35 years. Oh. Yes, for 35 years. What kind of aircraft? Um, uh, in the fleet, started off in A7E Corsairs and then started flying uh, the F-18 in the early days and flew the F-18 until I, uh, uh, I was a two-star admiral off of aircraft carrier, so almost uh, uh, 1,330 traps, I think, close close to that in um, 5,300 hours of flight time. So, so you, you are actually tracking exactly the path that your father did? Uh, yeah. Well, that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be him. But the three inventions that changed carrier aviation were the angled flight deck, that allowed us to land and uh, take off at the same time, but the most important piece was to land and get airborne again if you didn't stop. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the next piece is the uh, steam catapult instead of the hydraulic catapult, which we could better, um, you could better control the speed and the weight of the airplane given the, the wind over. Careful, how, 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 how does it work? Please explain it to them. The, uh, um, well, uh, the, uh, the temperature, the humidity, and the wind over the deck, and the weight of the aircraft, and the type of aircraft, and what the aircraft is carrying is all factored in. And um, uh, the catapult builds up a shot of steam and um, puts the airplane goes to full power but won't move. And then when they uh, launch you, um, it, it, it takes the steam and pulls a tube down the catapult track and drags the airplane and throws the airplane in the air. Mm. And the last thing is the, um, instead of having the landing signal officer using signals, was a mirrored lens called the Fresnel lens. Yep. Um, all three of those were inventions from the Royal Navy. From British. Yes, from the, Brit mm -hmm. the Brits. Mm -hmm. all th the Brits invented all three of those. And we still use them on all our aircraft carriers today. Mm -hmm. And the uh, steam catapult is uh, being used on the French carrier, the Charles de Gaulle. Um, our catapult and our arresting gear, uh, designed in Lakers, New Jersey, that are the same ones that you see on on uh, Theodore Roosevelt right out over here. How did you feel when you first take off and landed 
from the aircraft carrier. First time ever that you did. Shall I tell him? <laughs> <laughs> Please. When it came time to qualify aboard a carrier, we didn't have the carriers available and we were afraid to use the ones that we did have in the Atlantic for training because of the submarine threat. So the Navy took two dance horses in Chicago on the Great Lakes. One of them was a sable, the other one was a wolverine. They cut the decks off, made a deck, flight deck for them. The sable had paddle wheels on the side. I think it was a sable. And the other one had a stern paddle wheel. And that was where we care, care qualified. That was the first carrier landing. During World War II. World War II. And that was sort of exciting because it was the first one I ever made. And fortunately, I, we had to get six, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it was six. And, um, what airplane were you in? FMs. It was a single engine, small airplane fighter built by, the one that I was flying was built by General Motors, but it was really built from Grumman Aircraft people that designed it. And it's very crude. You cranked up the wheels, 29 turns, I can tell you that, to get your gear up. But uh, from there, we went to the F-6F, which was a much more sophisticated fighter at that time. Hydraulics, everything was hydraulics on it. Uh, the first jets were, were, we had an experimental jet program in the 49, 48 and 49, but we only built about 20 of two different types to see if we could actually use jets on the ship, which was going to be a problem. Because you also, Bill didn't mention it, but the exhaust, when the airplane's at full power, waiting to be catapulted there, mm -hmm. was really dangerous behind it. Well, they finally decided they'd put a system in hydraulically, raised a barrier up after the airplane to deflect Mm -hmm. the gas and the heat, but uh, originally we didn't have those on them. It, it just made great strides, in not only in this technology, but in increased the safety of the thing tremendously. Um, I have one friend who used to be a member of this organization that is having our convention here. Um, let's see if I can remember his name. He's dead now. Cook Cleland. Cook Cleland had a reserve squadron, which during Korea we called up all of the reserve aviation squadrons in the Navy. Cook Cleland squadron lost 13 pilots during the cruise, one cruise. Uh, our reserves took a terrible beating in, in Korea. Uh, they were playing... They were really flying a lot of obsolete airplanes from World War II is what was happened. Uh, and it was just, it was a very dangerous place to be flying. But um, I can't, I can't remember the first catapult shot. I can't really tell you. Were you, were you scared? Were you no, afraid? I don't think so. I don't think I was old enough to be scared. <laughs> <laughs> Those things just come along. You don't even think about it, I think, at the time. I always say, if you really want to be scared, just do a night landing on a straight deck. Let's talk about some soft side of the, um, the aircraft carrier. How many pilots and how many aircrafts, and where did you sleep? What did you eat? And by the way, were you married at the time? Not no. doing, yeah, I just got married in 49. 1949. Mm -hmm. ah. So tell me about those. How often did you write back to your wife and family? Pretty often. Uh, I would say 
several times a week. We always corresponded. It wasn't very good. Car mail service wasn't very good in those days, like it is now. The carriers in those days were very crowded. We had probably seventy something airplanes on the Twenty Seven Charlie. Seven, seven seventy something, something airplanes, yeah. uh, which would be five squadrons plus some additional airplanes for specials. The um, enlisted quarters on the ship were very crowded. Uh, once we got into Korea and they started sending some additional people, we gave even what we called hot bunks some of the people because we were so crowded. Now the officers and the pilots lived in rooms shared rooms, uh, and uh, the officers ate in a ward room, and the enlisted people ate in a mess, in what called, was called the, the, gal, the mess. Um, the food was always good. Uh, you didn't have a sea ration there. You had no, hot meals. No, they were hot meals. And they, later, they served 24 hours a day. So you could eat any time. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> we try not to encourage that today. Oh, uh, I just realized that you don't have microphones. So I, do you he's, pick he's, up the signal? Okay, signal. okay, good, very good. Thank God. I, I don't want to lose anything that you already mentioned. Um, do you still keep the letters that you? No. It's interesting, though, that I. Uh, I was in, visiting in Kentucky this week, and one of the cousins of mine, a cousin, yeah, one of my cousins had turned over four boxes of her letters from her father to her mother and her mother to her father. I don't know how he ever saved them in the South Pacific. There's 600 and something letters, and a um, one of my cousin's wife is a writer, and she's taken on the task to read all of these letters and to see if she's going to publish it. But none of my letters, I don't think, were ever kept. Uh, thank goodness. <laughs> Why? What did you write? <laughs> can't imagine I'd be very happy with them at this point. <laughs> but, um, How much were you paid? Well, let's see. As uh, In flight training, I drew $75 a month. As an ensign, I drew $150 a month and $75 flight pay. So almost 200 Uh I don't know what that would escalate today, but I bet it would be $500 anyhow. <laughs> you? How about during the war? Same. Same? Same. Just $200? Yeah. Maybe they didn't treat them? A over 200 probably. So what did you do with that money? Yes, you I are in, in, the, in the middle of sea. I had a wife. <laughs> she got the money, I think, more. Where, when you were born? 1955. 55, okay, so after the war, right, 55. Okay, um, let's go back to a little bit uh, on sort of uh, politics there. I've been interviewing Korean War veterans more than 200 Korean War veterans, and commonly they said they knew nothing about Korea. But now, Korea and the U.S. is one of the strongest allies, I think you will agree. And there's been a lot of publicity, and there were a lot of people educated during that period, too, of Korea, because they visited there. Yeah. Not a choice, but they visited. It is the strongest and one of the most closest relationships that we have been uh, building up. But when I look at the history, President Theodore Roosevelt actually had signed, I mean, let Secretary of War uh, Taft 
to sign the secret documents with uh, Katsura, the Prime Minister of Japan, in 1905 that the Korea, Japan can have Korea while we want to have Philippines in our, uh, under the influence, in the sphere of influence, and so on. And it's hard to put that kind of into a perspective. So I want to ask you, what's the Korean War to you? And what do you think is the kind of legacy of the Korean War and those pilots and other soldiers fought? Well, I think you have to remember that we have a history of defending people that are oppressed. Uh, when Truman made the decision for the United Nations to go into Korea, we supported it. It was uh, the right thing to do. We'd do the same thing today, I'm sure, if it had to be done. But I would, um, I don't, can't remember, as I said, one of us didn't know a little thing about Korea at that time. Now look at where we are. It's quite a change. Quite a change. Mm -hmm. Have you been back to Korea? Yes, I was on the 7th Fleet staff, which is headquartered out of, then headquartered out of Japan. I guess it still, still is. is. And I was on the staff, and I, we, we went to uh, Incheon, and we went to Pusan, the Naval Academy in Pusan. I think it was the Naval Academy. Jinhe? Yeah, around there. there region. Yeah. With uh, the staff when I was on, on a cruiser. That was the only time I've been back. And even, and now that was in the 60, 60, 61, 62, 63 time frame. And even then there was quite a difference in the change from what we saw when we were over there first. You never been in Seoul, you, you were in the sky and I, I'm yeah. sure that you had the aerial view, right? Yeah. What, could you tell me the detail, what are the difference that you really... Well, uh, just the, the industrial things that we now see in South Korea, even in 1960, we could see that was happening. There wasn't any of that in South Korea that I can remember when we were flying over it. There were no... You know, normally you're looking for targets. Uh, there, there were no targets in South Korea that we would bomb intentionally, I don't think, it, unless it was like Incheon having to get rid of that oil. We didn't dare leave that for them. For them. But there was no bombing of us particularly. There were no factories to be bombed or anything in South Korea at that time that were of value. The big thing was to get rid of everything going south at the start. But um, by the time I was back, I was really amazed that uh, in that short period of, uh, what, 10 years and few, probably, how much it had been done in Incheon and how much had been done in Busan. It was a, quite an achievement that you people did. Hmm. This is my gift to you. Well, thank you. It's the book that I wrote, and it's about... Um, simultaneous achievement of rapid economic development and democratization from 1960 to end of 1980s. It's one of the most concentrated developments in both area. And uh, we were not able to do it unless, I mean, without the American uh, defense of the Korean War and then the armistice that actually guaranteed the peace in the Korean Peninsula. And we had uh, access to the biggest market and best technology and, and best business model. And I wrote it from the perspective of Korean history, what kind of state and society relations were able to enable us to do so. Yeah. I mean, with the... Made a crucible to allow it to happen. Yes. So I would like to present it to you. I'm not done with the interview, though. <laughs> well, you know, I suspect that the Korean family is a lot like the American family, very mm -hmm. close. Is that true? Very, very close. I think that's 
what they need. Mm -hmm. That's the same way that the Japanese. Yes. I don't, don't know that much about China, but maybe it's an oriental thing, that they we're more like them in family affairs than the, anywhere else in the world. So tell me about your family relationship with Admiral. You said that you retired in 1970. Were you not ambitious enough to go up the ladder? Well, in my day and time, if you wanted to go to the flag, which he's a flag officer, which if you didn't, if you got a, you had to get a carrier. There was one aviator in my time that didn't get a carrier. His name was Gus Kinnear, and he used to live in his house, didn't he? Mm -hmm. And I remember Gus got a carrier, but I wasn't, I didn't get on the carrier list. I had two girls in college, and I decided it was a good time to retire and go to work on the outside. So that's what I did. So in 1970, you were like, uh, how, how old were you? Uh, freshman in high school. Freshman in high school. Mm -hmm. And I took a job with an aerospace company in Florida and uh, moved Bill in the Florida. The other girls were in college in Pennsylvania at the time and started over. Linda and my oldest sister is a retired school teacher down in Jacksonville, Florida. Actually um, retired, taught and retired from the same high school that my wife, Sherry, and I uh, met and graduated from. Ah. She's married to a retired Jacksonville detective, sheriff detective. The middle daughter, Candy, is a retired Navy captain a Navy nurse practitioner, retired as a Navy captain, married to a retired Navy surgeon. It's all about Navy here, huh? <laughs> so. Only she's junior to me. I don't have to salute her in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so we, lost, we lost mom two Mother's Days. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And she was the big influence on the kids, I think, because I was gone so much, she really raised the children oh. and did a great job. I myself growing up in the air base, K-2 in Daegu in Korea, and I've been all over. And my father was a pilot. He was disciplined, and I had a lot of influence from him. And most specifically, did you look up your father as a model, and what part that actually motivates you to become involved in? Well, actually, I didn't want to be in the Navy. Um, because See? Secrets coming out. <laughs> well, because I was a teenager, and maybe it's unique to our culture, but teenagers are fairly rebellious. And, um, uh, but I decided I didn't want to be in the Navy because we moved every year or two years. And I didn't want to move like that. I didn't, if I had a family, I didn't want to move like that. So I went to a small school in North Carolina called Elon College. Um, and I was with the intention to go to law school, to be a lawyer. And halfway through college, um, uh, with a history and political science degree and pre-law, I decided I didn't want to be a lawyer. But he only said I'd get, he, he bought my degree, but I, he only, I had to do it in four years. So what to do? If you would, can't change my degree. And uh, so I said, we went out on the Franklin Delano Roosevelt one time. A friend of his was the captain. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, boy, this looks like something I'd like to do. So I tried to apply. And on the third attempt, the Navy took me finally. Third attempt? Third attempt. Why? I, because I had no math or science. Oh. Just like me. <laughs> yeah, we're history majors, an honorable profession, but uh, uh, but it took it took a while. Um, but they finally took me. But I had no intention of staying in. Uh, but Sherry and I got married shortly after I was in the Navy and uh, my high school sweetheart, and we have been doing it ever since because we like what we're doing. He neglected to say that he grew up during the. 
Vietnam War. And like all of us, when we'd come home from Vietnam, kids had changed. There was a very anti-military. Yes. And Billy was, he may not admit it, but I'm sure he was influenced by that. I don't thing. think that never was an issue, Dad. I don't think that was never an issue. It was moving as a kid. <laughs> moving. <laughs> did well, you, you did. You understand that. Were you in the Vietnam War too? I was a, on a carrier in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And? Carrier and no, not a not a pilot. I was a part. Of, I was what's called the air boss on a carrier. I ran the flight deck and all of the people on the ship that dealing with the airplanes and launching them and recovering them. That was my job on the ship at mm. Midway. Midway. Midway, I see. Because you came to defense of Korea and we grew out of it. Something good came out of the U.S. Uh, it, uh, defense, the 12th largest economy in the world with the size of a little bit bigger than Indiana State, and we are the seventh largest trading partner to the United States. I think that's one big good thing came out of the Korean War and U.S. Um, aid. And then we fought together during the Vietnam War. Yep, that's correct. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? You know? Well, you know, I... Redeveloping the South Koreans is like redeveloping the Western Germans. I mean, it was something we felt we should do, and uh, we poured a lot of resources in both of those cases. And uh, look at the results. It's very good. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I was not involved with the ground forces in Vietnam and uh, I can't remember ever seeing a Korean ship that was involved with us. I don't in, think in so. There, but with, no. I'm sure there, there might have been. But, uh, there again, aviators don't see what goes on on the ground very much. <laughs> you didn't touch the dirt there. Yeah. Huh? Well, I think everybody would like to sleep between sh clean sheets every now and then. <laughs> The Ministry of Patriots and Veterans Affairs, it's a veterans uh, department of the Veterans Affairs in the United States. They run two uh, big programs. The first one is the Revisit Korea, Korea Revisit Program. So they invite the Korean War veterans to Korea. They cover everything, all expenses. And uh, when they come, it's an eye-opening experience for them because they told me everything leveled out, devastated. Now it's just, you know, Hyundai, Samsung, all these things. So that's what uh, they do. The other one is they invite descendants of the Korean War veterans, grandchildren in the age of like early 20s in high uh, college, and they invite from 21 participated countries. And they, we take them around the whole Korea and show them and demonstrate the byproduct of U.S. and uh, Korea alliances. That is a terrific program. Thank you for doing that. Yes, so my foundation, Korean War Veterans Digital Memorial Foundation, actually launched another descendant organization in the United States. It's called KWVYC, Korean War Veterans Youth Corps. It's like a Peace Corps created by the President Kennedy. And we had a big convention, big convention in Washington, D.C., and MPVA uh, is continued to fund those so that we're going to have a second convention, second convention uh, from July 25th to 28th because July 27th is the day for the armistice. Do you have any... Do you have grandchildren or great-grandchildren who might be interested in those? Well, I think your great-grandchildren are a little young. Yes. Four and two. <laughs> <laughs> One of them is six months or eight months yeah. or something. My, my grandchildren, Bill, Bill's two, are well dug in. One of them works for 
Apple Corporation. The other one is a senior in high in college. You mean this Apple? Yep. Oh, okay. And my other grandchildren. How are, old is he? Are uh, oh, Bill's son? Yes. Yeah. 20, 28, 29? He's, he's almost 30. Almost 30. Don't count on a 90-year-old knowing how old somebody is. I have trouble remembering how old I am. But anyhow, the others are... Um, Katie's running her own business. Yeah. I, my granddaughter on one side. The other one is a school teacher. And then I have one handicapped child, grandchild. So... Uh, they're all pretty well wrapped up oh. in trying to do their thing in this time. Yeah. yeah, please, uh, well, the I page it. there, yeah, okay. take it out, this one. And this is the actual program okay. from well, July 25th to 28th. And if any of your uh, descendants, actually, Admiral is descendant of the Korean War veteran. So it, We'll see, you know, how we can higher up the bar for, of the age. <laughs> but will, will you will you be interested in somehow kind of come and see how it goes or somehow, you know, we really need, I want to activate this youth core. Why? Because sooner or later there will be no Korean War veterans and, you know, it, it will be, you know, forgotten to everybody unless we activate this descendants. Be happy to support this. We'll put it on the calendar. Are you sure? Yes, sir. Happy to. Can you make a travel to and, and deliver a speech? End of July, I think we could probably figure it out. Wow. So if I can get it on my schedule, I'll get it on my schedule. Excellent. Happy to support. Wow. You are the first gener generation of descendants of the group. You're going to the Pentagon, though, and that's an awful place to visit. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that will be great. Okay, please ask your son to see if he can be more like a advisor rather than, you know, be the member of KWV Youth Corps. But I think we need to activate this. Could you give me some idea? I, I, I heard that you really talked to uh, Admiral for the first time about this war part. And how can we activate these young generations? How can we get interested in this? You, I know that it's hard. How? I well, don't know. Yeah, he just doesn't talk about his flying days. I'll catch him, though, talking to my friends when they come over. He's talking about it. They get it out. That's about his flying days. It's not about that uh, Korea. It's not just about flying, either, because I was home this past week in Kentucky, in, in Dayton, Ohio, and I visited with a my sister in Dayton and her husband was with MacArthur all through the island chains. He's never talked to me. This was the first time I got him to sit down and talk to me after all these years. It really, really is amazing because this seems to be common to most of us of our generation. So what are the points that I can ignite them to be interested in and keep the legacy of the their grandfathers. And I have to think about that one. I don't know. <laughs> so it's a tough, right? Yeah. yeah. I'm trying to uh, invite hundred of them, and everything going to be covered by my foundation because MPBA is funding too, and my co friends of Korean corporations also funding this, so that only only thing only portion that they cover is half of the transportation. Mm -hmm. I cover the. I mean, foundation covered Covered's another good. half. Otherwise, I already reserved the uh, Hyatt Arlington uh, and meals and everything free. What is the point that we can actually drag them into it and well, trap I, them? You know, uh, I think uh, two of his grandchildren are teachers. Uh, and so let's, uh, well, but Beth just had a little baby, so you're Gloria, young Gloria. But let uh, let me see if I can get the teachers involved. Okay. Can, you know the teachers of our youth. They're they're on the H O V lane to heaven. <laughs> you know the teachers are. Yeah. And uh, let's see if we can get them through the teachers. 
Actually, I invited one of the high school history teacher from Georgia, and whose father, uh, grandfather was Korean War veteran. And now we're looking at the coverage of the Korean War in the American history textbook in such a short, it's so just one paragraph. So we are trying to build up more materials, like a, including this kind of interviews and artifacts that I collected, and and trying to build up more materials for the teachers and trying to influence this, you know. We have a, we have a program um, uh, of volunteers uh, for World War II vets and Korean vets that get them to, that transport them to Washington, D.C. It's called the uh, Honor Flight. Honor Flight. I know. You're familiar with Yep, that? yep, yep. Yeah, so this Saturday, um, they're going to, uh, both Korean and uh, uh, World War II vets, we will uh, gather them up in um, Williamsburg and then transport them up to what? up to Washington D.C. We do it every year out of uh, Williamsburg. Mm -hmm. uh, went to, went to see them off last year. My deputy is going to see them off this Saturday. Do they have a website? I bet I bet Honor Flight does have a website. I want to be able to produce a synergic effect of what my foundation is doing so we can link together. Probably, yeah. And, and it's open to the Korean War vets. So, uh, They've got seven going Saturday. Seven, seven Korean War vets. I want to wrap up this interview. This is great, great interview because especially the descendant of Korean War veteran who is the admiral sitting right beside you and you are in the same career. Um, would you be willing to go back to Korea, I mean, visit Korea, if MPVA invites you? I'm beyond traveling at that distance anymore. Uh, I'm 90 years old, and uh, I'm showing my age and lots of aches and pains. So you have to, I really appreciate it, and I hope that you've managed to get some of them to go back. One more thing. I think you partially answered this, probably answered this question, but why people said that the Korean War is forgotten? Yeah. Why? Please, sir, could you focus? Well, I, you aren't talking to the people who served in Korea. They didn't forget it. I think that's, it's the people that really were not exposed to it that are forgetting it. and. We left it out of the history books for the younger people. So I can understand why they it's not being discussed by the younger people. How about it, Bill? Well, I, I just have to say that uh, following such a devastating war like World War II, and um, I just have to say that's probably one of the reasons. It got caught up in the history books as something following World War II, which dramatically shaped our world today. Uh, and I think that's the reason. But it's not because it's not important to the American people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, when we were growing up down in Florida, my best friend's father was an Army sergeant. Korea when he was flying over top of the draftee. Now, as a Korean War veteran, also Navy uh, officer, you experienced two major war, right? Vietnam and the Korean War. And what is your... Let me, uh, let me correct you. Oh, I'm sorry. World War II. World War II. Korea, Vietnam, and the Cold War. What is your message to young generations, both, I mean, most, I mean, in America. What is your, out of your military experience? Well, I hadn't thought about that either. <laughs> I don't, I'm, I can't really say. Uh, there's such a change in the attitude of the young people today what it was when I was raised and when Billy was raised. It's just unbelievable to me. Uh, I hate drugs. I hate 
the things that are going on that just seem to destroy kids and uh, they don't seem to care it very much. Maybe it's just me. I just don't think that the American youth has been raised at this point the ones that I'm worried about to appreciate what this country has done for them. Yeah, and I'm going to disagree with them a little bit here. <laughs> but, um, it wasn't allowed before. Yeah. But, uh, uh, He's grown up. <laughs> you know, but today we get the very best of the youth of America. That's America. right. But that's a small percentage. It's a very small percentage. It's a small percentage of who can do it. But uh, it's a, uh, those that join the military today, uh, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force, Coast Guard, Air, um, uh, Army, uh, the very best of the youth of America. They are exceptionally bright, exceptionally motivated, proud to do what they're doing. 100% of them volunteered to raise their right hand and to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And they did it when their nation was in a dying war. That's only 1% of America. But that's 1%. Right. Pretty damn special. So you are proud of your, your job here? I'm very proud of my mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, comments or the experience that you want to share with this interview about your involved in the war, Korean no, War. I, I can't think of anything at this point. Am I successful enough I to get so. everything out of you? I think so. Mm -hmm. You get more than I ever got out of you. <laughs> so then, this is final. As a Korean War veteran, looking back like 60 years, anything that reminds you anything that you want to say as a Korean War veterans uh, about U.S. and Korea relationship, your own personal experience, how this war affects you in, you know, your life? Well, it's one phase, one chapter in your life of many chapters here, but uh, I think that I, my impression of Korea recovering was so much greater than the than the actual war was to me. I just can hardly believe that the people could turn around and do, do what you have done in developing that country. It was such a disaster when we stuck started it up there, and I'm I'm certainly glad you are doing that well. And I wished I could visit with you. But I just can't do it at this point. So thank you for that invitation. Mm -hmm. Admiral, any, any message? Well, I think he said it all. You're one of our most loyal allies, one of our lo longest allies. We are uh, share the mission of fighting tonight, if need be, and we're never going to leave you. So if something happened, just in case, would you, would you do the same thing as President Truman and McAuf did? Uh, no, we'll, we'll follow through on our uh, commitment to you. That's what we're going to do. Yes. Because you remember how many um, uh, soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marine and Coast Guardsmen, and their families are in your country with you tonight. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much. Have you done, by the way, any interview with your father? Oh, first time. First time. First time. Wow. First. Thank you very much. On behalf of thank Korean you. nation, I want to thank you for your fight, so that we Korea now what it is right now. And thank okay. you very much again. And thank you for your Absolutely. valuable time. Thanks.